Hi, welcome back. We're going to go ahead today and we're going to talk through chapter 6 in our text, which is about dimensioning and notes. Now you will have noticed so far in our drawing practices that we haven't put any dimensions on our drawings and um, that makes them very incomplete. So let's go ahead and go through this PowerPoint and then we'll talk about, we'll talk through the PowerPoint on dimensioning and some of the um, guidelines that we use to make dimensioning as clear as possible. And then we will work through the tutorial in the chapter to discover the dimensioning tools that AutoCAD has got for us that makes this um, critical part of technical drawing a little bit easier. So I'm going to go ahead and give you my screen. And this is the, the presentation as usual. We'll start here. And what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to talk about dimensioning nomenclature and some of the basic practices. We're going to, as we work through the tutorial, display and use the dimensioning toolbar, use an AutoCAD dimension style manager. Um, and talk about center marks and actually put some dimensions on here. Now, the first bullet, that understanding dimensioning nomenclature and basics, that's um, not necessarily a trivial part of this topic. So let's go ahead and get started. So the reason why we need to put dimensions on is buried in this paragraph that, as usual, I'm not going to read to you. Um, what this says really is that a technical drawing must completely define the size and shape and features of an object. Part of that description will be the dimensions because the dimensions are what tell us the size and give us information about the shapes. So dimensions are very important to the clear communication that is the whole goal of technical drawing. So in order to be able to clearly communicate information about the object we're representing, we're going to follow some dimensioning standards. And dimensioning is kind of like learning a new language, so we're going to talk about this. So this 2.10 is the actual dimension. It is included, the number is included in a arrangement of lines that to they clearly communicate that this 2.10 is the distance along this edge. So we have names for all of these things as usual because this is, um, you know, this is engineering. So the extension line, so we, we won't be able to communicate clearly, and that means learning our language. The extension line is this line right here that comes down from the object through the actual place where we put the dimension. So it extends the lines between which we are dimensioning. And you'll notice there's a little gap there. The dimension line is the line that goes between the extension lines and tells us, and it's where we put the actual numerical value of that dimension. This whole arrangement together is the dimension. Now, dimension is an example of a local note. A local note is how we indicate something about one specific feature of our shape. And should always, local notes should always be close to the feature we're talking about and should always be connected to the feature by either extension lines or what's called a leader. And that's what this little single-headed arrow is. And this guy here is a diameter. So what this tells us, this symbol here means diameter. And it tell, this, this tells us, this local note here, tells us that this circle has got a diameter of 1.0. And then we've got a general note down here at the bottom that is kind of generally applicable to this shape. And what it says is that rounds and fillets have a radius of 0.15. So that means this little guy right here, this is a fillet. 
and so it's actually a radius of 0 0.15. Now, there are lots of conventions about these things, but the bottom line is that we want to make our communication as clear and precise as possible. So we're going to go through some rules and guidelines about dimensioning, and your textbook does this. Um, start on page 6-5 and then goes all the way through to page 11, just talking about the rules and conventionings for dimensioning. The real valuable thing are the examples of good dimensioning and poor dimensioning. So let's go ahead and work through some of those. There are two different systems to align our numbers with our dimension lines. And the most common anymore is called the unidirectional, and what that means is that all of your numbers, all of your actual dimensional values, are oriented to be read if, you're, if you've got the bottom of the paper facing you, so just like normal text. An older alternative system is called the aligned system, wherein the dimensions are all aligned with the leaders or the dimension in lines. If you're working in industry, be sure and know which convention your company uses and follow that convention. For this class, most of the examples are going to use the unidirectional, but you can set AutoCAD to make all of your dimensions be aligned. No matter which system you choose, you should make sure you use one of them in any given drawing. Don't mix and match. Make all of your dimensions be unidirectional or all of them be aligned. Oops. So there's a bit of an art to deciding what dimensions to put on a drawing. And it's not always the dimensions that we use when we're creating the drawing. What, they, what we want to be sure and include are the dimensions that anybody would need in order to be able to understand the function and or production of that part. So as you are, and, and a lot of times those will be the same things that you need to create the drawing. So keep those in mind. Um, but remember you're going to go back and forth a little bit with the engineer, between the engineer and the designer. You, and maybe even the shop, um, you'll figure out which dimensions to put on. But in general, think about what you would need to know if you were going to make this part or if you were going to use this part. The other thing to remember is that dimensions should always be close to the feature that they are dimensioned, that they are relevant to. And we'll talk through that some more. So general dimensioning rules. We always want to dimension features, not individual geometry. So if we look at this shape here, we could dimension, as we did down here, between these two lines. But that doesn't really talk about a feature clearly of the object. But if we dimension here off of the side view, we can see that this thing is 0.75 inches. This is, this is the, an example of good versus poor dimension. We always want to dimension the feature, the thickness of the object, as opposed to the distance between these two lines. That's why we'd want to dimension the location of the center point of the circle, as opposed to the distance between the center and this edge, unless that distance very clearly tells us where that center point is. And also choose the best view that describes the feature. So we wouldn't want to dimension the circle on the side view. We'd dimension the circle on the front view. OK, so this is good. This is not so good. The proximity rule simply says put your dimensions close to the thing that they are relevant to. So, and we also want to put our dimensions outside our drawing view as much as possible. 
And we want to put smaller dimensions inside larger dimensions. We'll talk about that one in a minute. But for example, on this good, this good example, we've got the diameter close to the circle, and this 0.75 is on the right of the drawing and doesn't cross over any other dimension drawings or any other dimensions, um, and is close to the circle that we are dimensioning. In the poor example, you can see we've put the diameter clear over here on the left, as well as the vertical placement of that center circle. We don't need to do that. Let's just put it close to where it belongs, close to the thing it is relevant to. And if we've got two views, and say this 0.7, this center circle is relevant to both of them, we just put them between the two views, but we only dimension to one view. Okay. If we are extending, if we're creating extension lines from object geometry, for example, this 1.00, you'll notice there's a little gap here between the extension line and the corner from which we are measuring. And this extension line, there's a little gap between this one and that, this extension line and that corner. We can use center lines as our extension lines. When we extend from a center line, there is no gap, as you can see here and here. Okay, now a minute ago I talked to you about putting smaller dimensions inside larger ones. So an example of that is we want this 1.0 to be inside the 2.5 and the 0.5 to be inside the 1 in this example of dimensioning. We're going to talk about, um, and we do it here again with 1.25 and the 1. There are a couple different ways to create this type of uh, dimension, set of dimensions, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so center lines can be used to indicate symmetry as well as for positioning. You want your center lines to extend about a quarter of an inch beyond the shape for which they are to indicate the symmetry, unless they are going to be carried out to be extension lines. So as we talk about these two drawings, the things to, to pay attention to, we've indicated that this shape, this, this, this thing is symmetric about this center line by using our dimensioning standards. We've got 1.2 and 0.6 and then we indicate that this is this cutout's 0.45 inches deep. This is a better practice than this where you put your center line just 1.5 from the edge and 0.75. The other thing we've done differently is we've located the center circle on the front view because that is the view that most is most descriptive of that center. This is this is a much better this is a much better way to locate and dimension this center than is this. Okay, just just compare the good and the not so good and make and, and try to understand uh, why the good one is better than the not so good one. And we want to dimension in this style. All right. So if we've got a view that shows, so for example, if we're doing an isometric or something where we've got one axis shortened, foreshortened, we want to always indicate dimensions on the view that shows the measurement in its true length. This is part of why orthographic projections are nice because they give us true dimensions visually. And I already said that we want to create, we want to place shorter dimensions inside longer dimensions. So down here, we've got an example of what not to do. This 3.5 crosses, the way it's currently oriented here, crosses both the 1.25 and the 1.2. Don't do this. Do it this way. Okay, put the longer dimension outside so we don't have to cross dimensions. 
Okay. The rest of these are just some general rules. Don't crowd your dimensions. Generally, we do local notes and leaders after we've put on all of our regular dimensions. Um, we also put general notes on after we've put on all of our local dimensions or our dimensions. Um, that's because we need the dimensions to be close to what they're talking about, and we want to place them first because there's going to be more of them, but we don't want to crowd them. So sometimes our space is small, and so, so we'll create an enlarged view or a partial view rather than crowd our dimensions. It's all about clear communication. We don't ever want a dimension to hidden lines. If we have to, we'll create another view so that the hidden lines are no longer hidden. Sometimes we'll do sectional views um, so that we can convert those hidden features into visible features and we'll dimension on that. So we don't want to dimension to hidden lines. No matter what our spacing is, we want it to be uniform. It just goes, it, just, it looks nicer and it makes for more clear communication if things look more organized. So for example, We've got a dimension here that is the first dimension we want it to be at least 10 millimeters from our object. And every subsequent dimension then is going to be 6 millimeters from that first dimension. So that doesn't have to be, these two distances don't necessarily have to be equal. But if we set this distance from here to here to be 10 millimeters, then we want that distance to be 10 millimeters here and here and here. So we want them all to be the same. We want these gaps to be 1.5 millimeters everywhere that we have a gap. And we want our text and arrowhead size to be consistent. And we want this extension to be consistent. And this is really where AutoCAD makes things easier because even when we were doing these drawings by hand, we wanted all these things to be consistent. There were all sorts of templates and um, aids to make that happen. But with AutoCAD, we can just set it up and the computer takes care of that. I'm going to, the rest of these are pretty self-explanatory. We're going to talk through them quickly. Um, you want always to show your overall width, height, and depth somehow on your drawings. Don't cross your dimension lines. We've said that a couple of times. Center your text between your arrowheads. It just looks neater. Unless we've got several parallel dimensions, like here. See across the top here, these are not centered. That's for ease of legibility. You want to stagger those so that there's no confusion. But over here on the side, everything is centered. Down here at the bottom, it's all centered. Okay. You want your leader, this leader, to be pointing to the center. Even though it's not going to go to the center you want, if you were to extend it out, you want it to be pointing to the center. It just looks neater. So for all round features, make your leader point to the center of the circle like this. Okay. Sometimes we can't communicate everything on our drawings, and so we've got symbols that we use to communicate additional information. And these are really relevant to machined holes. So we're going to talk about machined holes in this chapter as well. And you need to understand the different types of holes so that you can correctly depict them on the drawings. So this rectangle shape here, you can see it both here in our legend and right here on the drawing, tells us that this hole is a counter bore or a spot face hole. And it also tells us, so let's, let's take apart this, this notation right here. It tells us that the outer hole is, or sorry, it tells us that the hole has a diameter of 
with a countersink diameter of a diameter 1.5 and a depth of 0.5. What that means is the hole itself is a three quarter, we'll say three quarter millimeter or three quarter inch hole. The countersink is an inch and a half diameter and is half an inch deep. Okay. Or the counter bore, rather. This is a counter bore. A counter sink is a similar symbol. It's a little downward V. And this is a counter sink. So counter bores and counter sinks typically are created to leave space for a head of a fastener. Counter sinks are typically allowed to, or created to leave space for the screw head below the surface of the object. Counter bores are typically created to leave space for the head of a bolt, so that they aren't sticking up above. And so we've got information about all of these holes in these symbols. Your textbook will help you decipher these, and we'll talk about them some more later on. But this conversation is on page 6-10, step 19 in your text, too. Okay, rule 20. We don't want to cross leaders. Um, what that means is if you put your diameter leader in line with your center line, it crosses the center line. It's better practice to put it off to the side. We always dimension cylinders, holes, bosses by diameters. Arcs are dimensioned by radius. So we've got a diameter for our circle and a radius for our arc. No reason other than convention, it's just how we do it. But we do it that way because that's what everyone expects now, so we want, again, to be communicating clearly. And part of that clear communication is meeting those expectations. Okay, sometimes we need to dimension in both English and metric, or imperial and metric systems. And we can do that, we just have to be very clear, clear to indicate which is which, and we have to be consistent. Um, in this example, we've placed the alternate dimensions below our primary dimensions. Um, you can also do it beside them, you just need to be consistent as to which way you're doing it, and clearly indicate um, which is primary and which is uh, alternate. Again, don't cross your dimension, don't allow your dimension lines to cross. In general, when we're using metric system dimensions, we will be using a millimeters and round to the nearest whole number. In general, English system dimensions are given in inches and rounded to two decimal places. If you've got something that is less than a millimeter, you always put a zero in front of the decimal place, but when you use inches, you don't put a zero in front of the decimal place. It's just one of those weird convention things. All right, let's talk a little bit about machine holes. There are different ways that holes are made, and really the reason, the only reason you need to be know this is so that as a draftsperson, you can correctly indicate what the designer wants. So, Your textbook on page 12 in chapter 6 gives a pretty good definition or description of all of these different types of ways of making holes. And I'm going to leave that reading for you. So be sure and read pages 12 and 13 in your text. I do want to talk about baseline and chain dimensioning. And really what that refers to is just a way of dimensioning across an object. So for example down here, this object is a total of 3.75 inches long. 
and we've got two holes spaced one inch from either end. Now you notice that we didn't dimension this hole is one inch from and the other hole one inch from the other edge, although we could have. What we did instead was we used what's called chain dimensioning, which means we started at the lower right hand corner and we first indicated the location of the first hole and then we went on over and indicated the location of the second hole relative to that first hole. The other way of doing this is called, so we dimensioned the first feature to one edge of the overall object and then the second feature is dimensioned to the previous feature. The other way of doing something like this is called baseline dimensioning. And that's what's been done up here. The, what baseline dimensioning does is it establishes a reference point, in this case, the upper left-hand corner of this object. And then all of the features across the top of this object have been dimensioned back to that point. So we've got 1.25 inches from the outer corner of the feature to the left-hand edge of this notch, and then 2.63 to the right-hand edge, and then 3.75 to the far side of the feature. Typically, when tolerances between adjacent features, so for example, these holes need to be 1.75 inches apart, when that's more important than the overall tolerance of the object, then you'll use chain dimensioning. When the location of features have to be controlled from a certain point, so for example, this notch needs to be 1.25 and 2.63 inches respectively from this corner, you'll use baseline dimensioning. Sometimes it's a judgment call. Um, the important thing is to get the dimensions on there. Okay, you need to be aware that tolerances can accumulate. And, and tolerances are the allowed error in a measurement. And what happens is just like any other error, they, they, they build up. Um, so we need to be aware as designers of the precision that is required or the degree of accuracy that's required in manufacturing. There's always going to be a little bit of error in any manufacturing technique. We cannot do make things to absolute exact measurement. That's why we have tolerances. So this chart just kind of gives you a general idea of the tolerances that we use in machining. We'll talk later, uh, well, we'll talk in just a minute about how we indicate those tolerances. So we were talking about dimensioning, and we've got an example here of chain dimensioning. And our standard tolerance for all these dimensions is 1 one hundredth of an inch, which means that our actual finished part is going to be somewhere between, for example, on this notch, 1.74 and 1.76 inches. We dimension it to 1.75, but we should indicate that dimensioning. And we can do it in a couple of different ways. Um, one way is with the plus minus. So this whole thing is 4.75 plus or minus three one hundredths of an inch. Now, it's three one hundredths because this guy is plus or minus one one hundredth. This notch is plus or minus one one hundredth. And this notch is plus or minus one one hundredth. So, yeah, those all add up to make three one hundredths. So the lower limit on this thing is, it's going to be at least 4.72 inches, but it could be as much as 4.78, even though we've dimensioned it as 4.75. The way we indicate that is with plus or minus 0 0.03. Okay. 
And here we have, again, the same sort of thing, 1.73 plus or minus 0 0.01. Okay. We can avoid tolerance accumulation by being very careful with what we choose to, or we can avoid, yes, by being careful how we dimension things. We can minimize that accumulation. Okay, we can't minimize the accumulation in the real world, but we can minimize how much we have to do as far as figuring that out. No matter how we figure it, they're still going to accumulate. Errors always accumulate. Okay, let's get into AutoCAD. Um, do read this, sec do read chapter six. There's a lot of great information in here. I've just kind of brushed the surface in the interest of time. I'm going to uh, stop this recording and I will come back with a second recording for the AutoCAD demonstration. The AutoCAD demonstration begins on page 21 and I will begin my demonstration with the part created. So let me show you what my, where I'm going to start so that you can get yourself to this point. I'm going to start here. So this creating this didn't require any new skill. It's, I did was able to do this with skills that we have covered to date in this course. So um, before you watch the AutoCAD demonstration video, make sure that you've gotten your um, drawing to this point. We are creating a dimensioned orthographic view, two view orthographic projection of this P bracket design. I highly encourage you to sketch the orthographic views. How many views do we need to fully describe this object? And I encourage you to sketch them out on paper using the techniques that we've already talked about. The dimensioned view of this is on page 23 in your text. And I will talk to you again soon. For now, um, look at page 23, sketch out your orthographic projections, and then create this drawing in AutoCAD. And we will pick it up from here.